try to make these uh, remarks brief, but not too brief, so that folks can can migrate in at the last minute here. Uh, my name is Edward Davis, and I am the paleontologist in charge of the condom fossil collection for the museum. And I'll be introducing our speaker tonight, but I had a couple, three announcements I wanted to make ahead of time. <clears throat> One of them is that we were fortunate enough to have the University of Oregon duck mascot visit the fossil collections. <laughs> La late, late last academic year, and we've been able to make a video of that and post it on YouTube. So if you have the opportunity to go and search for UO Paleontologist on YouTube, you can find that video, and uh, it is quite entertaining. Yes. All right. Uh, the other things I wanted to say was I want to remind everyone we have two more lectures coming in our Archaeology lecture series this fall will be on the following two Fridays. So next Friday, the 12th, we have Scott Fitzpatrick from our own anthropology department speaking about his research on the archaeology of Palau Micronesia. And he's talking about a rock shelter whose name is in a language I cannot pronounce, so I will let you read it on the documentation, but uh, I encourage you to attend that that talk as well. And then on the 19th, we'll be lucky enough to have Anna Roosevelt coming from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and she's going to be talking about um, additional information on the peopling of South America. So that will continue the theme that we're going to have today, uh, talking about the way the first Americans found their way here. Okay. Uh, but today, I'm fortunate enough to be able to introduce John Erlinson, who is the director, the executive director of our Museum of Natural and Cultural History. And uh, he's been with the University of Oregon since 1990, and since 2002, he's been a Knight Professor at the University of Oregon, and that reflects his excellence in scholarship, uh, teaching, and service to the university. Okay, but uh, what's really important to me is that he's been Executive Director of the Museum of Natural and Cultural History since 2005. And since he's been the director, we have grown tremendously as a museum, uh, both as far as our research and impact on research on campus, but also as our impact into the uh, education of the community in Eugene. And so, amongst other things, John has overseen the addition of our new anthropology collections wing, which I understand we just completed moving all of our specimens into that wing now. It's a process that took more than two years. Um, we have doubled the exhibit space under John's watch, and uh, as part of that doubling of the exhibit space, we actually have uh, a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences to prototype the, f the fi final full exhibit. So right now in the museum, we have a series of prototype exhibits, and we'd like everyone to take an opportunity to go and comment on those exhibits um, to let us know what works and what doesn't work so that the final exhibit we have will be informed not only by the scientists and the educators at the museum, but also the people who make up our wonderful museum community. And lastly, and most importantly, for the future of the museum, John has overseen a vast growth in the endowment funds that we have so that we're going to have uh, the funds in place to continue to be excellent over the next century. Okay, and I really think that this success is possible because John is a scholar and a gentleman. Okay, I like to think that that he's able to be such a wonderful director because he understands the scientific importance of the objects, the artifacts and the fossils, but also because he understands how important communicating our knowledge from those objects is to the public. And uh, he's going to be doing an excellent job of that tonight. He told me not to pump this up too much, but I think I may have done it. <laughs> tonight he's going to be telling us about the enigmatic chipstone crescents. These are beautiful specimens in their own right, uh, but they also have a lot to tell us about the peopling of the new world. And the work that he's going to be giving tonight is actually a preview of an extensive new research program. So I'm excited to see what he has to say. So let's please thank John Erlinson. An introduction like that, I think maybe Edward must be coming for me to me for a raise next week or something. <laughs> that was very nice, Edward. Thank you. Uh, as Edward said, this is really a preview of research that, that is ongoing, and it's actually part of a cooperative research project that I'm doing with my wife, Madonna Moss, who's also a professor of archaeology and a curator at the museum, sitting in the front row here taking notes. <laughs> and uh, Madonna has a month-long residency at Playa on the shores of Summer Lake starting later this month in part to work on this project. <laughs> 
And I purposely called this talk Connecting the Dots because all the dots haven't been connected on this idea yet. And we're still trying to tease out some of the patterns and the meanings of the patterns that we find. Uh, but they do, as Edward said, revolve around some, an enigmatic artifact type called chipstone crescents. And I think the first time I ever saw a chipstone crescent was 1995, perhaps, when it, one was found on a project that I was directing down along the Santa Barbara coast in California. But I didn't find one myself until sometime like 1996. So that was 20 years of archaeology on the California coast and the Pacific coast before I ever found a crescent. They're relatively rare artifacts. And I think if you polled most archaeologists who have worked in the far west, most of them would say that they've never found a crescent. So I've been very fortunate in recent years to, to find a lot of crescents, as you'll see, which has led me to think a lot about crescents and what their deeper meaning might be. So I also want to start a little bit broadly by saying that if in thinking about where we live in the Pacific Northwest and the far western edge of North America, we really kind of stand at the triple junction of a, of a series of different theories and, and paradigm shifts that relate to the archaeology of coastlines, human migrations, and the peopling of the Americas. And some of these are, well, the three that I identified anyway, are a new, relatively new consensus view that people like us, anatomically modern humans, evolved relatively recently, somewhere around 200,000 plus or minus 50,000 years ago in Africa, and then relatively rapidly after about 75,000 years ago spread around the world, and in most cases replaced other hominids, hominin species, and then moved into a series of new areas like Australia, the Americas, the Pacific Islands that had never seen humans before. There also has been a, a shift in the last 20 years uh, from a view that coastlines were really kind of marginal to human evolutions, human evolution, that they weren't really heavily settled or intensively used until very late in time, something like 10,000 years ago, to a new view that suggests that coastlines and seafaring and fishing actually played much more important roles in human evolution and migrations than previously thought. And then finally, and maybe most importantly for tonight, and here in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, is the collapse of the Clovis First model and the transformation of the coastal migration theory from a marginal theory to a mainstream theory. And I, when I talk about this in various public venues, I usually tell people the story about when I was writing my dissertation in 1988 that one of my advisors actually implored me not to write about the coastal migration theory because he said it could ruin my career. And I did, but I did it very carefully, and I've actually written about it, I think, relatively uh, carefully ever since. But during this period of the last 20 to 25 years, there really has been a paradigmatic shift to where recent polls among North American archaeologists suggest that more than two-thirds of them now think that the peopling of the New World probably initially started around the Pacific Rim and with the coastal migration. Now some of this has been, been driven, these paradigm shifts have been driven by archaeological discoveries, but frankly a lot of it has been driven by genetic discoveries and new work on human DNA from living peoples and ancient peoples and the field of genomics that's telling us a tremendous amount about where humans evolved and how they migrated around the world. And one of the things that has come out from those genetic data is that, in fact, there appear to have been a series of coastal migrations that really weren't anticipated, and they mostly happened near the end of the Pleistocene, and it's difficult to find them archaeologically because sea level has risen something like 400 feet in the last 20 to 22,000 years. So most of the coastlines that these anatomically modern humans travel along have been submerged. This creates really pretty serious challenges for coastal archaeologists who want to look for earlier evidence of human occupation in coastal zones. Well, and then getting back to the peopling of the New World, this is about 10 years old, I think, maybe more than that, from Newsweek. This was after the Kennewick Man case really kind of exploded in controversy. And Newsweek covered the most recent stories about the peopling of the, New, uh, peopling of the Americas. And then also has posed the question of, was Clovis first? 
And if there's anyone here that doesn't know what Clovis was, the Clovis is marked by these large, distinctive lanceolate blades that have these large flutes. What did I do with that thing? There it is. These large, well, the battery seems to have gone out. Large fluted flakes off the base. These are very distinctive. They're found all over North America. And where they're found and well dated, they generally date between about 13,100 to 12,700 years ago, something like that. A relatively short-lived phenomena, but very widespread geographically. And traditionally, when I was in undergraduate and also in graduate school, it was always taught that Clovis was first. And therefore, if you found a Clovis point, anything after that or anything different from that had to be younger than Clovis. And here's the, the traditional view. I've shown this before here, I think, but here's you know, the, uh, the traditional view of a terrestrial migration of hunting peoples out of Northeast Asia coming down through the fabled ice-free corridor, through uh, the Yukon and Alberta, and into the center of the continent, and then only gradually spreading out, usually hunting large mammals, and gradually reaching coastlines, and then learning how to fish and live by the sea. This was the dominant theory for much of the 20th century. Um, I think I have quacks in the eyes. There was a really interesting paper that stimulated me to think about what crescents might mean and also what birds might have meant to early Paleo-Indian peoples in Western North America. This was written in a paper by Stuart Fidel, written in 2004. And he was doing it in response to sort of the beginning of the collapse of the Clovis theory. Because one of the things that helped collapse it was that a site was found in South America, in Chile, the Monteverde site that's well dated to about 14,000 years ago. And yet geological evidence suggested that the ice-free corridor didn't open until around 13,000 or 13,500 years ago. Now this created a fundamental problem. How did people get to coastal Chile if that corridor through the interior wasn't open. Around the same time, there was new geological evidence that was suggesting that the coastline of the North Pacific uh, deglaciated considerably earlier than that, and that basically the coastlines of the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, were essentially open by about 15 to 16,000 years ago, uh, some of them even earlier than that, which kind of shifted paradigmatic thinking. Now, Stewart has been an ardent uh, defender of the Clovis first. He probably will be till the day he dies, uh, the Clovis first model. And he's not a fan of the coastal migration theory. And so part of the argument that archaeologists have made against the, the uh, ice-free corridor is not just that it wasn't open, but that it was a paraglacial environment that would have been basically sterile with very few resources, very difficult for people to travel through, and that wouldn't have been very attractive to early humans. So even after it opened, some people have argued that it might have been 500 or 1,000 years before people would have passed through it. Well, as part of his last ditch defense of Clovis I, he came up with the quacks in the ice model. And he pointed out that upper Paleolithic peoples in Northeast Asia appear to have relied pretty heavily on birds and waterfowl. They have a number of carvings in ivory of ducks and geese. There are duck and geese bones and swan bones in some other sites. And he argued that the central flyway, which today has millions of birds that migrate north and south through it, uh, down through the Rockies and the east side of the Rockies, would have been really important to these people coming down the ice-free corridor. First of all, seeing a bunch of birds flying south down that corridor would have implied to those people that there was something livable beyond it, that it was worth pursuing, follow the animals. And then he also argued that those animals themselves, rich in fat and protein, would have provided a, a, a wealth of resources to Paleo-Indians. So it was birds, basically, that were drawing people down the ice-free corridor. Well, what I, I thought that was a pretty brilliant idea. It was very interesting. But the thing that Stuart forgot about was there's something called the Pacific Flyway. And for those of us who live here in the Pacific Northwest, have spent any time in the Central Valley of California, 
or southeastern Oregon, the Klamath country, there are seven million ducks and geese that come down the coastal route today. And it's probably considerably smaller than it once was. So at the same time that he was pointing out how important the central flyway was, he managed to omit the fact that there was a very rich Pacific flyway that might have also attracted coastal migrants. So we come back then to that question of which came first, was it Clovis or was it something else? Stem point makers, perhaps. And here I just show you one of those absolutely typical diagrams that all archaeologists used to see in their classes as undergraduates and grad students that shows Clovis at the bottom. Everything above that has to be younger. And remember, a lot of those artifacts don't necessarily come from stratified, datable contexts. Well, here in the Northwest, that bottom row down there is what we call Western stem points. We have fluted points in Oregon as well, but they're much less abundant than they are in Eastern and Central North America. And there was an argument that actually unfolded for decades about whether or not these stem points were older than Clovis in the Northwest. Alan Bryan and Ruth Grun battle, or fought that battle for decades and, and basically lost in the mid to later 20th century. And the Clovis first people shouted them down and argued that, in fact, no, it was Clovis that was first. And all those stem points had to be younger, even if they're not dated. Well, you know, so all the archaeologists, they find those Western stem points and they kind of sort them chronologically if they don't come from well-dated contexts and they must be younger, so they're younger. But maybe they're not younger. And this is something that uh, Dennis Jenkins and colleagues working at Paisley Caves, where Luther Crossman worked decades ago, uh, doing very careful work over the last decade or so with the Northern, ba Northern Great Basin Field School from the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. One of the things that they've addressed is whether or not Clovis was first. What they found was, well, they've, they've accumulated now about 200 radiocarbon dates in very finely stratified sequences, uh, very high resolution record of both ecological changes, geographic changes, and also human cultural debris. And you've heard some of this story before by Dennis or others. Uh, camel bones dated to 14,300 years ago. A human coprolite that's produced human DNA dated to 14,300 years ago. A horse bone, 13,130 years old, about the same age as Clovis. Twisted grass thread, 12,750, about the, the age of the end of Clovis. And yet here at Paisley Caves, as published in Science earlier this year, uh, there is no Clovis technology. And what there is instead is stem points. Not very many of them but three or four of them that now appear to be relatively well dated to Clovis age or slightly earlier. And so this has revived then this argument about whether Clovis was first. Charlotte Beck and George Jones a couple of years ago wrote a paper knowing something about Paisley, even though uh, they weren't working there at the time, that suggested that in fact there were two great early technological traditions in North America. One was Clovis, and one was the Western stem peoples. They argued that the Western stem peoples were descended from coastal migrants into the New World, people who moved from the coast up the river valleys into the Great Basin, and that Clovis was descended from Eastern North American peoples who moved west and then ended up intermingling with Western stem makers in the west. That too was a really interesting idea. It revived an idea that really hadn't been thought about or argued for several decades. And it too stimulated my thinking as well as I think the thinking of Dennis and, and Tom Connolly here who's participated in some of the Paisley Cave analysis and publication. Well, long ago, Cressman also found one of these. He found a chipstone crescent at Paisley Caves. And because of the nature of the excavations, I don't think we can place that crescent particularly well in time. Um, but these have been found all over the far west, and they've been found for well over 100 years. They show up in lots of old monographs like these two on the left, one from Lake Mojave, California. Here's another from Borax Lake up in uh, north, northern California. And then on the right, just a sort of typical lunate chipstone 
crescent, a series of them that are kind of half moon shaped or quarter moon shaped, and then these other weird variants that are usually found more in California. These are very enigmatic artifacts and, and very distinctive artifacts. When you find them, you know you have something early, although we haven't always known just how early. They've typically been thought of as an early Holocene or maybe late Paleo-Indian marker in the western U.S. The first real synthesis about chipstone crescents was by Lewis Tadlock in 1966 in American <coughs> Antiquity, and he defined three different types, these quarter moon, half moon crescents, and these little bit stranger butterfly crescents down here. And he argued that, that these three types in the Great Basin all had relatively great antiquity, at least 9,000 years, and that would have been radiocarbon years. So translate that, it's probably 10,500, 11,000 calendar years or more. He noted that they were closely associated with lakes and marshes and other aquatic habitats, and also with these early hunting peoples. They're found in sites with western stem points, occasionally with Clovis points, but I don't think they're ever found just with Clovis points. They're always found in sites where there might be western stemmed and Clovis. And he showed the distribution of them up into the Columbia Plateau, into southern Washington, out into the eastern Great Basin, throughout the Great Basin, and then all through California. And in this particular paper, he pretty much didn't talk about California. I think partly because there's so many crescents in California, and he was trying to synthesize as much as he could about them, but he also didn't talk much about California because in California they do all sorts of weird things. They have three types in the Great Basin that are all sort of similar, these lunate, half moon type of things. And in California you get all of those and then you get all these other things as well. And uh, in 2010, Garrett Fenenga, who's been studying California crescents for 25 years, published a monograph that, that um, included a summary of a fellow by the name of Albert Moore's work who went to museums all over the country and took photos of every crescent he could find from California. And the database after Albert Moore died almost got thrown away and then his wife found it and realized it was significant, gave it to an archaeologist who then gave it to Garrett because Garrett is even more obsessed with crescents than I am. And then he analyzed it and, and put out this monograph. And they, he showed that Albert Moore, working at the same time as Tadlock, identified at least 18 different types of crescents. So in California, you have those lunates, and then you have all these weird notches and projections and uh, just really strange crescentic varieties. And I think Tadlock just didn't want to get into it. It was too weird from a Great Basin perspective. That's California, you know. I wanted to point out here that uh, I talked about associations of crescents with aquatic habitats. The single most amazing site that I know of uh, that's produced lots of crescents is one called the Witt site on Tulare Lake. And if you drive down towards Baker, Bakersfield on I-5 today, you go by Kettleman City. And at Kettleman City, you're pretty close to the Witt site. And if you look over to the left, you won't even see a lake. You might see a little bit of a salt pan there, but Tulare Lake used to be 687 square miles large in the historic period. And it was a very large shallow lake. It was in fact the largest body of water west of the Great Lakes until it was drained in the late 1800s to create more farmland. And right at the south end of that lake, there's a very subtle ridge about a meter higher than the rest of the valley that goes for seven miles, and it's covered with Palo-Indian materials. Stem points, Clovis points, and crescents, and what I'm told is that something on an order of 1,000 to 1,500 crescents have been picked up at the Witt site over the years. Now that's one of the reasons that you get so many weird varieties, because there's just lots and lots of them. Unfortunately, the Witt site is very difficult to date, other than and there really aren't any carbon dates, there's no good organic preservation that makes dating uh, relatively precise. But it's an amazing site that's produced an amazing array of crescents. Well, with all this talk about crescents and people writing about them for a hundred years, uh, one of the reasons they're enigmatic is that nobody's ever really agreed what they're for. And you'll notice if I was to go 
back just a moment, that sometimes they're illustrated this way, with the legs or the concavity down, and other times with the concavity up. And there are people who are so obsessed with crescents that they have long, long, almost violent arguments about whether or not <laughs> you should have it this way or the other way. And I don't really care, so what I've done is I've started to just show them both ways. And then nobody can argue with me as they're reviewing my paper for publication. <laughs> so that fact that nobody's even sure which way they're oriented is one of the reasons that nobody really can agree on what they are. Among the various things that they've been suggested to be are transverse projectile points, hafted like that on the upper left, animal effigies. There are bear-shaped um, crescents, and in fact, the California State Prehistoric Artifact is called the Golden Bear. It's a crescent from Orange County. Uh, on San Miguel Island in the late 1800s, there was a doctor who found these ones on the lower right. Because he was a doctor, I suppose, he suggested that they were for surgery, which uh, led one, I think, Great Basin archaeologist to suggest that there must have been a vast medical center very early in the eastern and western Great Basin. Others have suggested they're for harvesting, harvesting plant foods, that they're scrapers, that they're little mini ulus like those Alaskan women's knives, uh, that another proposed that they are for gutting rabbits, uh, specifically rabbits, which doesn't really work for me, as I'll show you. Uh, the thing that's always struck me and, and others, I think, is that when you find them in finished form, and this is the problem with analyzing stone artifacts, is they're not always in finished form. You get people making something and it breaks and it's only halfway done. Or they run into a problem with a big lump that they can't get, move, you know, remove with flint napping, and so they chuck it or they make it into something else, or they use it for some other uh, tool purpose. But when they're finished like this, they're always bisymmetrical. Whether they're lunates or whether they're those weird um, notched ones, they're always bisymmetrical. They're flat and they're relatively thin. And they're oftentimes, if you look at them in cross-section like these middle views, a little bit thinner on the center than they are on the edges. And then finally, especially in the Great Basin, along the midline, here and up there, they're often intentionally ground. Those sharp edges are ground, just the way many stem projectile points and Clovis projectile points are. And the probability is that that grinding is to facilitate hafting, so that when you wrap sinew around it or some other cordage around it, the sharp edge of the tool doesn't cut it. And so it allows you to to haft an artifact uh, without cutting through the lashing. That then tends to support the idea that they were hafted in one way or another, possibly as projectile points. Well, another thing that people will just get in terrible arguments about, I've been confronted by Garrett Feninga at the Southern California, or no, Society for California Archaeology meetings two or three times in which, I mean, I literally couldn't get away for an hour I was trying to get on a bus one time and I almost had to pick up my case and beat him away because <laughs> I had to get to the airport. And he was telling me, they can't be projectile points. They can't be, you know, they've got to be this, they've got to be that, but they can't be projectile points. Well, all I know is when you go to the literature, if you look at historic arrows and ethnographic arrows and modern arrows for hunting waterfowl and other birds, they often have these broad tips and they're designed not to penetrate a bird, but to stun them, to break a wing, to break a neck, to disable them, to knock them down so you can retrieve them. And so here's a um, you know, historical drawing from Saxton's Pope's uh, 1923 discussion of early arrow types and arrowhead types. And he shows a crescent <coughs> bird point and then an Indian bird arrow. A lot of the, the ethnographic bird arrows are these ones with the cross sticks crossed like that. Very broad, blunt ends. And then we've got this medieval one on the upper right and these modern ones down here in the center and the, and the lower right that show that at least in many cases, people who are hunting birds with arrows are you know, trying to find some way to have a broader impact. And so that led me to think, well, you know, I'm not, I haven't really been a goose or duck hunter, uh, but why don't hunters use 22s? I got on the web and I started looking up goose hunting and duck hunting you don't find any pictures of anybody using a 22 
or a small bullet. They're all shooting shotguns, of course. Why do people shoot at waterfowl with shotguns? Because they're more effective. And probably when they didn't, they decided they wanted to bring home a few more birds for the work uh, early mornings in cold marshes. And so they took to using shotguns because it's a much more efficient way to knock down birds, especially in flight. And I think that's what crescents are. I think these tra they're transverse projectile points first and foremost. I think oftentimes artifacts have multiple lives. And so some of them may have been picked up by um, later peoples and worked into animal effigies or reused for other purposes. But I think most of them first and foremost were transverse projectile points with the idea that this is the shotgun approach of shooting an atle dart or an arrow at birds in flight. And this also just happens to show how productive bird hunting can be, especially waterfowl. 1,029 geese in one day, I believe that is. Okay, well, I've made my argument, and I might not change it, at least not lately, or not right away. But what does that have to do with the peopling of the New World? Well, you know, we go back then to the coastal migration theory, something that uh, my colleagues and I, a corollary that we called the Kelp Highway Hypothesis that I've talked about multiple times in Eugene and won't go into a lot here. But again, you know, it's the view that basically nor um, Upper Paleolithic peoples in Japan, the Kurils, Northeastern Asia may have moved into Beringia and then ultimately followed the coastlines down into the Pacific Northwest, California, and all the way down to coastal Chile. And that birds and fish and shellfish and seals and seaweeds, oftentimes the same species or the same genus, were found throughout this red zone in kelp forests from Japan to Baja California, and that it would have been entirely at sea level, a relatively easy route, I think, that was rich in both terrestrial and marine resources, as well as waterfowl in coastal estuaries. And the Pacific Flyway may have been uh, quite productive back then and may have contributed then to the subsistence and the stability of early Paleo-Indian economies. Well, now I'm gonna take you to the Channel Islands just to update you a little bit on my recent research related to these topics. I'm working mostly on the Northern Channel Islands, have been for several years uh, with National Science Foundation funding, and this is what the Channel Islands looked like, something like 14,000 years ago, and then 12,000 years ago, and then about 10,000 years ago when they broke up into individual islands that still exist today. And you, this shows you some of the problem that archaeologists have if we want to find early coastal sites, because you had to have boats to get here. Uh, in all likelihood, then, they were seafaring peoples and maritime peoples, and those types of peoples tend to spend most of their time along the coast, and yet all these shorelines are now relatively far removed from the modern shorelines. So we had to start modeling, well, you know, what is it that would have brought coastal people into the interior, even for a few days or a week or some part of the year? And on these arid islands, it ends up being things like springs, freshwater springs during the summer months, uh, cave sites. It's really windy out on western Santa Rosa and on San Miguel and Santa Rosa today. So getting out of the wind is significant. Finding a cave where you can get out of a storm or the wind uh, is very attractive. Uh, we're also looking at toolstone sources. We know these people use chirts to make a lot of their early tools. So where might they have been drawn into the interior away from the coast to gather chirts and then make tools? And then finally, lately, we've been uh, working on a series of sites that are up on high bluffs that provide very strategic views of the paleo shoreline and the paleo landscape that would have existed back then. And all of those areas are producing large numbers of early sites. I started working at Daisy Cave in the 1990s, uh, and I guess I haven't quite finished even yet, although I largely finished around uh, 1998. There's still a few things we're trying to tie together. But Daisy Cave was occupied from earliest occupation about 11,600 years ago up through about 8,600 years ago. 
And this is the first crescent that I ever found. Uh, after we'd finished our excavations, I still monitor this site for coastal erosion and concern about looting and things like that. And eroding out of the sea cliff one day, I pulled this uh, little lunate crescent um, that was, appears to be between 10,000 and 8,600 years old. And then after that, we started finding these sites. Uh, these are only about a kilometer and a half from Daisy Cave. And it's a raised marine terrace, a raised beach that's relatively old, but um, it has lots of cobbles of two different types of chert. And Palo-Indian peoples were coming up to these localities to collect those cobbles. So there are quarry and workshop sites that have small little loci where people camped. And so they have small shell middens, and we've been able to date uh, five of those shell middens so far, and they date between about 12,200 and about 11,400 years ago. And they've just produced hundreds and hundreds of stone tools, mostly bifaces, but lots of these kind of projectile points. And you can see stem points on the right, stemmed and barbed, what we call Channel Island barb points. And then on the left, we call those a mole points, Channel Island a mole points, which a mole is the uh, Shumash word for ancient or old. And then in the middle, you can see three or four, five crescents, different varieties. Uh, and these all appear to date between, as I said, 12,200 and mostly 11,700 years ago. And we found dozens of crescents here. Well, these Channel Island barb points, again, I've talked about these before, but these are very significant because they're just incredibly well made. These are incredibly talented flint nappers who are making these very delicately barbed and stemmed and, and needle-shaped tips. And we always thought, these were found in museum collections only for years, and we always thought they were 2,000 years or less, and that they were arrow points made by very recent peoples. Now that we're starting to find all these early sites, we're finding these in stratified um, archaeological contexts where they're clearly as much as 12,000 years old, and then persist until about 8,000 years ago. So here's some of these, uh, I mean, you know, maybe the two most beautiful examples, one crescent and one a mole point here from the Channel Islands. Ultra thin and just incredible artistic talent. And then in the, in the course of all these surveys that we've done on San Miguel, and now we're extending that work to Santa Rosa, on San Miguel alone we now have 50 or maybe 60 sites that date to this time period that have produced these uh, crescents and, and stem points. And that really is remarkable when you consider that, that all we have is the upland portion of the landscape, that the shorelines are submerged, um, and that there must have been many, many more sites associated with these early people. And also that every single trip we take out there, we find two, three, four more early sites. So this suggested to me uh, what I wouldn't have believed 20 years ago, and that's that, that not only were there people on the islands relatively early, which I knew, but it looks like they were there year round, maybe as early as 12,000 years ago, and maybe even more, and that there were a lot more people on this landscape than we thought. And for me, that kind of implies that if there were more people 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, then they probably have a deeper demographic history that we still haven't understood yet. We haven't found the earliest sites. Well, some of the most remarkable sites that we have found uh, I have Arlington Springs on there, which is famous for producing three bones of somebody named Arlington Man, was then switched to Arlington Woman, and then back to Arlington Man again, um, dated to about 13,000 years ago, which is Clovis Age. And the problem was that there were never any diagnostic artifacts found with the Arlington bones. And so I always, for you know, decades, Arlington Man was found in 1959 and redated in the late 1990s. Uh, we've always known Arlington Man was old, 10,000 plus years old. And I always kind of assumed that he probably was a Clovis person because there are Clovis points, a few have been found along the adjacent coast of California, including the Santa Barbara area, which is right across the channel. And I thought if we worked long enough and hard enough on these islands that we'd eventually find some Clovis points. But we haven't. We haven't found a single one. What we find is hundreds of stem points 
scores of crescents, and no sign of Clovis technology at all. Near Arlington Springs, in just the last few years, we found two sites that are very important, SRI 512 and SRI 26. They're both deeply buried and well stratified, well preserved, and very well dated. This particular one is two and a half meters down, buried at six soils below the surface, and here we have, so far, two post holes, maybe a third post hole, and a well-defined pit that suggests that, that we may actually have a structure or a house at this site. It appears to have been a winter occupation, and it's produced scores of these Channel Island barb points, more than 20 crescents, and just thousands and thousands of bird bones. And most of them are large migratory waterfowl from the Pacific Flyway. These are Canada geese, Aleutian snow goose, white-fronted geese, and they come down from Beringia in the Arctic uh, in the winter and probably were wintering on the California Channel Islands. And I suspect when humans first got there, because there were no large predators, no terrestrial predators on these islands, that there may literally have just been millions and millions of geese and ducks. They're still on the islands, but there aren't very many of them anymore. Partly because humans came out, partly because they brought dogs, partly because they appear to have introduced the island fox, and all of those introductions of predatory animals, including humans themselves, have interfered with the waterfowl and the breeding um, and nesting birds on the island. So if you think again about those crescents, and here I've shown a hafted version of one and a Canada goose and an amole point, probably used uh, the amole point on the right for hunting sea otters or seals or something like that. But I do think that these transverse points are most likely for bird hunting. I mean, the associations are very clear. Lots of crescents, thousands of bird bones. And then you can see, you know, when you, when you spook the birds and you think about that shotgun approach with the transverse points, that's what you want to be shooting at birds like that. You have a much higher probability of bringing something down than just shooting a little pointed bird point through the middle of that flock. So then we take the story back to the larger Pacific Flyway, this red Eclipse, ellipse here, uh, shows the approximate distribution of crescents in the far west. You can see the central flyway that Stuart Fidel wrote about off, off to the edge. Uh, and then we have the Mississippi flyway and the Atlantic flyway represented there in yellow and purple. All of these are very large and very rich today. But the other thing that we know about western North America at the end of the Pleistocene was that it actually was much wetter than it is today. And when you read the literature about the number of ducks and geese that are found in Western North America and their population fluctuations historically, there's a very clear correlation between large droughts and the drying of lakes and marshes and a reduction in the number of waterfowl. It can be quite substantial very quickly. Well, at the end of the Pleistocene, this is what Eastern Oregon looked like. And look at Nevada. You think of Nevada today as basically dry, desert. Some might say wasteland. I'm not going to go there. Um, but look at that. It looks like it's 40% water. And a lot of these are shallow lakes, kind of like Tulare Lake, that are optimal habitat for geese and ducks. And so I think it's quite probable that at the end of the Pleistocene, when humans first came into the New World, they looked at landscapes like this, and if there are seven million waterfowl in the Pacific Flyway today, which many of the wetlands have been drained, uh, many of these lakes have disappeared, there could have been far more birds at the end of the Pleistocene, and they may have been really key resources for the first Americans. Well, here's a map that I, I took uh, Google Earth and then placed as many of the crescent localities as I could on it. I think I have California pretty well covered, but this is a work in progress. There are some more Nevada localities, some more Oregonians, and probably some more in Utah as well. But it, it at least shows you the general distribution of crescents in the, in the far west. Um, and you can, they're really abundant in California and the Great Basin, and then beyond the Great Basin, they're very rare. 
and you can see there are a lot of them in California. And if I were to somehow modify these individual dots, not just for localities that have produced crescents, but then scale them up for how many crescents have been found, the Channel Islands would disappear completely, uh, and, and California would have huge numbers of very large red circles. And then here's what North America looked like during the last glacial maximum. We're actually here. We have the ice-free corridor open. So this is closer to 13,000 years ago when we know humans were here. We suspect now from genetic data and, and archaeological data that humans were here a couple thousand years earlier than this, maybe 3,000 years earlier. And this actually gives a rather bleak view of the coast showing it locked in ice. The coast was more open than this. Uh, certainly 14, 15, 16,000 years ago. But my point here, here is, if you're thinking about flyways of waterfowl in North America, and these are birds migrating to the Arctic to feed in the summer months on the richness of productivity, and then migrating back south to avoid the cold and feed in more productive areas to the south. Where were the Atlantic and Mississippian birds going? They didn't have any Arctic to fly to. And if there was an Atlantic flyway or a Mississippi flyway and even part of the central flyway, I would guess it was greatly attenuated and pushed way south. And the migrations that were going on were largely you know, from sort of periglacial areas in northern United States and then down maybe into the Gulf of Mexico and further south than that. So I think this landscape, the late glacial landscape of North America, probably had a tremendous effect on the productivity of these waterfowl migratory flyways. The Pacific Flyway, on the other hand, Beringia was unglaciated throughout the last glacial maximum. There were you know, some mountains with some glaciers, but it was largely unglaciated. And uh, so I think it should have retained its productivity and large numbers of birds uh, throughout uh, the late glacial period. And then you can kind of reimpose those crescent localities on there and then and look at them. You know, they show up, they're right south of that ice free corridor area, but only a few. And the vast majority of them are over in the Pacific Flyway itself. And this suggests something really interesting to me. We, I've always wondered, you know, why are crescents only found in the far west? There are people in eastern North America. They're Clovis peoples. Why aren't, why aren't they using crescents? And I've always kind of assumed that it had to do with some cultural difference, some technological difference. You know, that western stem peoples were different than Clovis. They used different types of tools. But this suggests at least a possible ecological explanation for why crescents didn't go farther east. Maybe there simply were no Mississippian and Atlantic flyways and crescents, there were far fewer waterways and shallow lakes and marshes. Maybe they just weren't productive enough to make using crescents and pursuing waterfowl particularly productive. And then I've shown this before, but this is meant to go back to that whole stem point makers, western stem tradition, and show that here's the incipient Jomon stem points uh, from Japan dated to 16,000, 13,500 years ago. This is part of my kelp highway presentation. And to show that these points look quite similar to later paleocoastal points from Santa Rosa. Well, what happens if you look further afield from the Great Basin or the Northwest? We can find stem points well beyond the area that we're talking about in North America. They go to Japan, they go to Kamchatka, um, they go up into Northeast Asia. But do you find crescents any further? Well, if you do, they don't call them crescents. And because we've been calling these things crescents for 100 years in California and the Great Basin, we readily recognize them. But as I went to the literature and started looking for things that might be crescents further on, I found this one from uh, the Little John site in the Yukon. This is a site dated to about 14,000 to 13,000 years ago. So it's basically precursor to Clovis. And they had this turned the other way. It was up and down, and it was called a double side scraper. But to me, it looks like it might very well be a crescent. The Little John site, along with other early 
uh, complex that they call it now the Western Beringian Complex in Alaska. There are lots of bird bones in there. There's tundra swans and, sh and uh, geese that are being hunted. And it's at least possible that there is something comparable to a crescent there being used for the same purpose. And then I started looking at the literature in Japan. Now, I don't read Japanese, so I'm not very good at this. But I got on the web, and I saw these things from Hinata Cave on the bottom. This is, again, incipient Jomon. And the one on the left, yeah, you know, it might be a crescent, but it could be almost anything. It might just be some weird scraper. But that one on the right, to me, looks a lot like it could be similar, at least. Ultra thin, uh, very well made, very flat. Uh, relatively symmetrical, bisymmetrical. And if you hafted it in a transverse manner, you might very well say that's a crescent as well. There are also lunates. They're called lunates around most of the rest of the world. They're found in South Africa. They're found in the Far East. They're found in Northern Europe. And they're often around the end of the Pleistocene. And they're often used by people who hunt birds. So then I can take that map. Uh, this is a map that Todd Bragey and I produced uh, a few years ago, and I've shown it in this series before. But it's meant to primarily show that there are western or these stemmed points around the Pacific Rim, that there's a lot of big gaps between them, but they could at least be markers of a coastal migration. And here, without trying very hard, I was able to at least add a few things that might be crescent-like and might have been used for the same purposes which might then show some technological links uh, to the crescent makers in the far west as well. That's pretty speculative at this point. So in concluding, I'd say the Clovis first model is dead in the water. <laughs> I still like Stuart Fidel and his quacks in the ice, but he needs to find a new ax to grind, I'm telling you. So we need to look for other alternatives, other reasonable alternatives. And it now seems quite likely, if not highly probable, that a coastal migration contributed to the initial colonization of the Americas, and that it was facilitated in part by the richness of coastal <coughs> ecosystems, kelp forest, estuaries, marshes, lakes, rivers, and the Pacific Flyway. Early stem point traditions, including the crescents, along with the stem points in both Oregon, the Channel Islands, and throughout the far west may very well mark technological trail cookie crumbs in, in a sort of way of a Pacific Rim migration from Northeast Asia into the Americas, probably beginning around 16,000 years ago. These early coastal peoples, I suspect, if they did come down the coast, they didn't just haul ass to San Diego. They often came to rich estuaries like the mouth of the Columbia, the Nass, the Stikine, the Klamath River, where there were probably, in some cases, especially further south, very rich salmon fisheries. And they, many of them probably turned left and took detours into the interior and sort of adapted from the coast to estuaries, to river systems, to lakes and marshes in the Great Basin. These were natural corridors for fishing peoples to follow into the Pacific Northwest and the Great Basin. The early post-glacial geography of North America and the evolution of the Pacific Flyway may very well have provided a rich landscape for these western stem people and help explain the restriction of crescents to the far west. And finally, the U of O and the Museum of Natural and Cultural History, archaeologists are playing a central role in these scientific discoveries relating to the peopling of the Americas four science papers in four years. There aren't very many museums in the US that can say that. So go Ducks. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure. Can you repeat the question so that right. it's picked up? I can. So I'd like to. Uh, Thanks, John, and uh, I'll be happy to moderate the questions now if anybody in the audience has questions for me. I've got one. We'll go here and then over here. Um, the, the, uh, the crescents, if, if, they, if they do, if they were uh, arrowheads, I think it might be important to, to uh, consider what, what they would do in flight. 
uh, if the arrows were flexed, I think that's the right word, uh, then they would spin and it would carve out a cylinder through the air that would be in diameter to the outside of the, of the crescent. So, so it would be sort of like the, the, the shotgun blast that, that you were preparing to. <coughs> So uh, I think you might, your argument might be strengthened if you can point, point that out. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then a question, has anybody actually taken, made one of these, or, or I think that the old ones would be too valuable to use in, in a national experiment, but, but there are nappers that, that could probably produce something that looks like this, put it on an arrow, and shoot it. I, I think you would find that if it was not symmetrical, it wouldn't fly well. You would not know where it was going to go. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you completely. And, and uh, I didn't mention it tonight, but, but I will now because you're a good question. Uh, I, when we published this paper in Science uh, a year and a half ago that showed all these crescents from the Channel Islands and showed that they were 12,000 years old, uh, you know, there was a lot of media attention that went with it. I got emails from flint nappers and replicators. And there's this one group, and they, you know, their leader wrote to me and said, we don't believe those will fly. And I said, well, try it. And they tried it, and they got back to me and said, amazing. They fly really well. And then I had an old friend from Santa Barbara who fools around with these kind of things, and he <coughs> sent me a video clip. And he had actually hafted it with the concavity out towards the end. But he had a guy with a video camera and he took an atlatl and flung the dart at that guy. He must have been a brave guy or had a suit of armor on or something. But in slow motion, that dart was going like that. It was spinning as it, as it hit the ground right in front of the guy's feet. So you may be absolutely right that uh, with the right kind of fletching, it wasn't simply a plane that cutting through the air, but a spinning, rotating, uh, tip that would have been, you know, even a broader target than it appears. And then the last thing I'll say is that uh, there's a grad student down at uh, Cal State LA who is right now is, is replicating them and he's going to be mounting them on arrows and, and uh, going out and doing some hunting and trying to test whether or not this is actually more effective um, at bringing down ducks and geese. I'm not suggesting you go home and do this and shoot at birds, all right? My wife is a great bird lover, and I kind of like them too. But uh, Kevin, he does these kind of things, and he's got a permit. And so I think there are people who are very interested in the replication uh, of both flight and you know, trying to test these hypotheses of whether they'll actually fly well and work well. There also have been some people who have argued that you can skip these off the water if you shoot them right, with an atlatl, slinging it like that, and kind of bounce them into birds sitting on the water. But I don't think anybody really very good at it has tried it. Um, there have been a couple experiments where people said that they could skip them off the water, but that's an interesting idea, too. So we had another question over here. And this is amazing to me, again, because there's been so many decades where everybody has been so focused Uh, the question is, with DNA from ancient human bones, have we been able to make connections around the Pacific Rim? Well, the, the first thing to know is that it, it, it's quite difficult to do that analysis because many tribal members and Native American people don't want their ancestors' bones ground up, and we try to be very sensitive to their concerns. But there have been a few cases where um, archaeologists and the tribes have worked cooperatively. The Kennewick Man was a big controversy, lots of lawsuits and conflict. But about the same time, there was a, a human remains found up in southeast Alaska that dated to about the same time period, over 9,000 years old at Onyanese Cave. Uh, 
and the Clinkett people up there worked with the archaeologists. They did extract DNA and they did a study of it and, and published a paper a few years ago that suggested that it was very similar to people elsewhere along the Pacific coast, including some Chumash people, living Chumash people in Southern California, and also it made some link to Northeast Asia or China. And Illinois Hopewell, yeah. Illinois? Wow. What about the Anglo-South American? I'm, yeah, yeah. And there, there have been other genetic studies from modern humans that, you know, you, they're very sophisticated with statistical analysis and looking at distributions of various DNA um, haplogroups and haplotypes and different mutations. And so there are a series of, of papers that have been published in recent years that have suggested that there does appear to be an early series of connecting the dots of, of a lot of coastal peoples and that they're more closely related and that those relationships go all the way from North America into South America. Uh, and then that many of the people in North America through broader North America are, have a wider range of diversity in their DNA, which has suggested to some genetic people that there was an early migration down the coast and then maybe another wave of people moving into North America. And so it's quite possible that there was both migrations down the coast and through the ice-free corridor. And which one was first? We don't know yet. Other questions? Madonna, do you want to answer that? You can probably do it better than I can. Well, I, I'd say one other thing related to that, and, and that's um, a number of years ago, we worked with the Chumash people to excavate an early burial that was eroding out. And it wasn't eroding out because of natural erosion, but because of overgrazing on the islands. And we, it was a cooperative project. And we weren't able to get DNA out of those remains. They still haven't been published, and it's not really public knowledge, but there, there's just something really strange going on when this individual was about 9,500 years old, and, and the federal government feels that it can't argue that this was a Native American because the judge, was it the Bolt decision? No, what was the, what was the decision? <coughs> Kennewick? Gelder. Basically argued this is not a Native American. And yet, in this case, this is at least 5,000 years after we know humans came into the New World. How can they not be Native American? They've been living in the Americas for 5,000 years. For me, it's a legal technicality that defies all logic. Yes? Yes. 
crazy world. That's a good question. The question is, uh, if, if a lot of the shorelines and coastal lowlands are now underwater, are there new technologies to explore those landscapes, the submerged landscapes, and try to find sites and excavate sites? And there are, there are new technologies, and they're getting better. Um, so there's submersibles, and there's remote-operated vehicles, and they have had some success in various parts of the world at finding submerged archaeological sites. Some of them uh, there's Neanderthal remains off the coast of Europe, uh, Homo erectus artifacts off the coast of South Africa. There are intact shell middens in the Mediterranean and around Denmark that you know produce structures and boats and amazing preservation. And there have been some submerged sites found in the Americas. I think the work has been fairly preliminary and um, unfortunately on the Channel Islands, and I think on the Oregon coast, because the wave energy is so high, that you can expect that the erosion was very heavy as, um, as the sea levels rose and probably would have done a lot of disturbance to those archaeological sites. But there are certain areas like around estuaries and sheltered coves and things where I do think there's still some potential to find underwater sites that have some integrity. And I think it's one of the last frontiers for archaeology on Earth. We have time for one more question. Yes? Who's it going to be? <laughs> I saw this one. I'm going to ask a question. Right? No, sorry. You have a question. How extensive or, and or intensive is the uh, archaeology effort in the Ashby Corridor? Yeah, I think there's still quite a bit of work being done, uh, and there has been a lot of geology <laughs> done. There has never yet, to my knowledge, when you, you, know, you get up into the heart of the ice-free corridor, well up into it, there's never been any site older than 10,500 radiocarbon years. It's younger than Clovis. There has never been a Clovis age site found in the ice-free corridor except way down at the southern end in Alberta where, you know, it might have been open but not fully open. So it, it's always amazed me when I, when I finally became more forceful about writing about the coastal migration theory. One of the criticisms used to be that, you know, you don't have any sites, you don't have any technologies for a thousand kilometers up and down the coast that are early enough. And so they had to come through the ice-free corridor. Well, that ice-free corridor is 1,500 kilometers long. And there wasn't any Clovis sites there either. But they managed to dismiss the coast as a migration corridor and accept the ice-free corridor. On the other hand, there's been geological data that, you know, that have suggested to some that the corridor was just closed, basically. You know, it was not passable until 13,000, 13,500 years ago, which has had a big influence on archaeologists. But I'm not sure that that geological work is absolutely final yet. I think it's quite possible that with additional work we'll find that the corridor might have been open a thousand years earlier than that. And then it could at least theoretically account for Monteverde or maybe even Paisley Caves. There's still more work to be done. With that, let's thank John again.